If you go to the uh, old library in this college, you will find a first edition of Robert Hooke's Micrographia. And that book from the 1600s essentially was the start of microscopy. Hook took very thin slices of cork bark and found that when he took transverse and longitudinal sections and looked down a microscope at them for the first time, they looked like monk's cells in a row. And so he coined the word cells and really discovered that life forms were formed from cellular material. Now, before I show you some cells, in, and what happened with the electron microscope, I need to get you to do a bit of maths. And the maths are just powers of 10. This is about 20 millimetres. Tenfold, two millimetres, you can see the ridges in your thumb. Then, if you jump another tenfold magnification, you can actually start to see the cells inside the dermis of your skin. Another tenfold jump, and now we have to use not millimetres, but microns, a thousand microns in a millimetre. And you can now start to see that the structure of cells has lots of substructures. You can take this, jump again, we're now two microns. Two one thousandth of a millimetre. And now you can start to see some components. These are all cartoons, of course, they're not real microscopes. You take another tenfold jump to point two of a micron, you can see little tiny structures inside the organelle. And then another jump you move down to nanometers. And nanometers, a thousand nanometers in a micron, a thousand microns in a millimeter. Now in the tenfold jumps, we can start to see protein molecules. And then another tenfold jump to two nanometers, we start to be able to see atoms of the protein molecule, well, the, the amino acids, and then you can see the atoms in another tenfold. So you can go from your thumb in tenfold jumps, and it's this area that the electron microscope enables us to work in. So when we look, your thumb is in the millimeter, centimeter areas up here, and the naked eye can resolve that. <coughs> the light microscope does cells like hooks or plant cells and animal cells in these micron areas here, a thousand microns in a millimeter. And the electron microscope can go from atoms to all of these cells across virtually the full scale. Now, <clears throat> it's not just magnification that happens with a microscope, but it's resolution. There's no point making something bigger and bigger and bigger if you can't resolve it. And all resolving is, is can you see the gap that there are two thumbs here or one thumb? Can you see the gap between them? So you're measuring, and the, small, the best resolution means the better the microscope. And here we have Ernst Abbe, and here's the bit of maths here. And this is his original uh, <coughs> detection for uh, equation for resolution. Resolution is, uh, is equal to lambda, which is the wavelength of the light, over some other stuff. Now, you know enough about an equation that if you want the resolution to be really very small, you're going to have to either make the bottom of this equation big, or you're going to have to make the top of it very small. The top is the wavelength of the light. You can't do anything about the wavelength of light, it's physics. But if you jump from light to electrons, you get an almost immediate thousandfold better, smaller number here. So your resolution on this side is massively enhanced. And what does that mean? It means you have to build now a very complicated microscope. One type is called a transmission, the specimen's put here, and you beam the electrons down through it. And another one is here, a scanning, where you scan across the surface. So one is doing internal structure of a cell, and the other one is doing external. But this is what resolution really means. This is exactly the same magnification of a fungal spore. Groups of fun fungal spores, this is pushing the light microscope, and here you see the electron microscope, it's just idling because it uses electrons which have much lower wavelengths and so you get much bigger a resolution, better resolution. So magnification isn't really important in, in microscopy, it's resolution that's important. And that's the kind of scanning image you can get, that's just pollen. 
And so now you can resolve pollen grains in all their intricate beauty and you can see the different types of pollen from different trees very easily in a scanning electron microscope. This is the head of an ant. And here you can see the scanning electron microscope not just magnifying the ant but resolving it. You can see the compound eye, the antennae and so on. This is the eye and the proboscis of a moth. And so you see this exquisite resolution that an electron microscope can show you. And this, you're listening to me because in your inner ear, there's a small group of structures. This is 720 microns, this distance here. These are about, so this is about one tenth of a millimeter across from this point here to this point here. And you can see the exquisite beauty. And these are little fibers that vibrate in your inner ear. So you're listening to me now because these little uh, fibres in your inner ear, and we can see the beauty of these. They look like organs, uh, organ pipes, don't they? Smaller than whole mammalian cells or plant cells are bacteria, and here's salmonella. And here, now looking inside with a transmission electron microscope, not the outside, a bacterial cell, very simple, a plant cell, much more complicated a nucleus, lots of the organelles and structures in the cell. And we can see that now because of the electron microscope in exquisite detail. This guy now, even more magnification, but still good resolution, the flu virus. And now you can start to see even the protein molecules of the flu virus. And this virus, you all recognize this virus, don't you? So this is Ebola, and here Ebola exploding out of a cell. Now the parasite that I work on, which we use a lot of electron microscopy to study, is this one in Africa. Uh, it, it's the trypanosome. Here you see it in a blood smear in the light microscope here, sub-Saharan Africa, spread by the tsetse fly. And here in a patient's blood you can see the parasite with the red blood cells here. Now, electron microscopes don't have any colour. However, you can false colour images in a computer these days. So this is my picture of the trypanosome in blood. And here's the trypanosome and here are those red blood cells at the background. And so this is the parasite. Now, <coughs> I'm going to show you to finish some really very different microscopy, which is much more uh, cutting edge. This parasite has a structure here, a flagellum, which it beats and moves with. The flagellum goes inside the cell at this point here, and we'd like to see inside. But we don't want you to just see little slices of bread and then try and think what the loaf looks like. We want to try and actually visualize big chunks of the cell. We can do that by a technique called electron microscope tomography. So imagine you were sat here, and I'm gonna take you on a journey all the way down through that cell. And we do that by, instead of taking a thin section and looking at it, we take a big thick section, tilt it, make lots of images of the different tilts, and use a computer to put them back into three-dimensional space. And that's called tomography, like the tomography you know for, uh, for, uh, for imaging the body or the brain scans that you've seen. But we do it at the cell level. And here we are here, and you're now sat on the top of the cell and I'll just go back, you're sat at this point here and we're going to travel down through what we call the flagellum pocket, which is where all of the eating of the cell will happen. And so if we can just run the movie. So now, instead of seeing static images, we can visualise all the structures. Here's the flagellum pocket. And then, over the next months, you can draw around all of those structures and you can model the whole cell to see the three-dimensional structure of the cell up here. And you can then take bits away, look at it, and see the three-dimensional orientation of all of the cellular structures that were there. And we wanted to know, um, <coughs> in that area, that's the area where the proteins from your blood are taken in. And also, if antibodies attack this parasite, they then are cleaned by taken into that area and taken into the cell. So we needed to want to know how does that happen? And if we run this movie, 
You'll now see a flagellum pocket coming in at this point here, all the organelles. Watch this pocket here and you'll see a little vesicle budding off there. And that's how it, it takes in gobbets, as it were, of material into the cell. And if we go to the next movie, you can see the same cell, but now modelled. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, this is, every single structure in here has been drawn around with the computer to build a three-dimensional model, which we can then look at. And that little vesicle is the blue area here. So once we've done that, in the next movie, which I'll move on to, we want to know what happens when this divides. There should be two pockets. And we can go through and build a tomogram of a dividing cell. One pocket here, another pocket here. And can it still do this eating process whilst it's dividing? And then, and you can see all this huge, beautiful structure, which actually too little time to tell you about. But here's the model of that dividing parasite that you've seen. One pocket here, another one here, and we can map in spatial terms every one of the vesicles which is taking material in from the plasma that's passed in here and the parasite is eating. And from that we can understand how it's actually getting its nutrition from the body and understand then how we might be able to uh, disable that process. And if you just run this movie, you'll see that now with models like this, you can ask in three dimensions, do these vesicles come off particular parts of the, of the cell and so on and so forth. So what we've been able to do is we've used the electron microscopy really as one of the tools which is so important in biological sciences. And in our work, which we use it with molecular biology and biochemistry, We've enabled this tomographic technique, which has only developed in the last five or six years in biology, to really be able to look at big portions of the cell and then find the three-dimensional spatial uh, aspects, understanding the cell much better. And for us, in this particular small project I've shown you, it was very important to understand actually how the cell was eating as it were, through these vesicles budding off into the cell. And from that process, we can learn a lot about how the parasite operates in the body of the host. Thank you very much.